You know, Kamasi Washington said, said to me, I'm telling everybody, there was two things that I'm a real broken record on since we've gone into isolation. The first one, and I wish I could remember who quoted me on this, but said to me, as soon as the doors closed on the world, they said, mourn your plans and make new ones. And that kept me going for quite a while. And I liked that because it created closure and allowed for possibilities of new beginnings. Most recently, yeah. I've, I've been feeling a bit of melancholy again just because of the uncertainty of it all, right? And I spoke to Kamasi Washington the other day and he said, uh, it's going to be a great harvest. After we finished speaking, I just went and thought about that and I thought what that means. And I thought what it, what it takes to get a harvest, preparing the soil, planting the seeds, protecting the crops, ensuring that others don't actually chip away and destroy the crops before you can you know, you can harvest. And when you get a great harvest, everybody eats. And I just thought that was a beautiful way to look at it. And I wonder kind of, you've got so much to look forward to going forward. And this album is such an important part of your creative outlet, whether you agree with that, you feel positive right now and amongst all of the change. Yeah. You know, I, I believe in duality in life, the yin, the yang, the option, the free will to see something in two ways. And it's up to us to have that perspective. And that's really what kind of the lyrics of Smile talk about yep. is choosing to start to see in a different way. And then that rewires your brain, which is the most important part of your whole body. Which you can do, by the way. And that is lesson number one when you think you can't get past it is the brain can be rewired and you can mold. It's malleable. It is. So I haven't said, oh... 2020 is the worst year because we're six, seven months into it. And also I have a child on the way and that's that's not a good spell to cast. Yeah, let's bookmark this in a different way. Yeah, let's bookmark this in the, hopefully in 20 years when I can look back, I can say, wow, 2020, it was challenging. But out of that challenge came the most beautiful thing in my life, right? And when you look at the album cover for Smile, you see me as a sad clown, and then you see the smile kind of in this smile font. It's not me going, hey, smile, like, or shoving happiness down your throat, or you got to stay positive, you got to stay optimistic. It's melancholy. It's satire. It's melancholy. Yeah. I found my smile, but I'm not stupid enough to think that, you know, it's going to stay this way forever if I don't keep doing the work. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, Smile is a real representation to me. The record is a representation that I got through it and overcame to the other side. I'm not saying I'm, I'm going to always be on this other side. I could, you know, fall backwards. The mind can trick you, right? But I, at least I have this touchstone now of a body of work that says... No, you did it once. You can do it again. It's possible. It's possible. I don't feel like Katy Perry of Prism could have walked away. I feel like it was like, I'm going to stay on this road until, some, until like you said, the fans say, take a break. You just weren't going to stop. <laughs> could, could you walk away now? Could you walk away happy now? Could you disappear? Well, well two things, two things. Disappearing is extreme. I love what I do. Is it though? To disappear into a private universe and raise your family and people have done it. I, I mean, sure, but I'm sure a lot of those people still feel very creative and, and, and wish, you know, for an outlet. Um, for me, it's not about disappearing. It's about balance. It's about having some freaking balance in your life. It's about the art of saying no. It's about... <laughs> yes. I think Prism is when the, when like I started to really kind of come awake a little bit. You know, I, I was just a bit fantasy land, idealism, candy centric, creating a character that was just pure fun and pop and entertainment. But Prism was definitely like, ooh, there's something else here. Yeah. You know, so that's when the real investigation started. But it's not about walking away. And that's the thing is like, I don't want to ever choose between being a mom and doing what I love. That, you know, is so archaic. I think the fucking reason why women get the responsibility of creating another life is because they can fucking do it all in a pair of heels, bitch. 
So it's not about choosing. It's about balance. Bitch. <laughs> Bitch. <laughs> and that, in turn, is why I wrote What Makes a Woman. Bitch. <laughs> yeah. Which is one of the high points on the record, which is why it ends the record, of course. Anybody who knows how albums get made know that song one and song 12, 10, whatever it is, are really important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's like album 101. <laughs> so for it to be at, at song number 12 and to, to bookmark the record, I feel it deserves some time. I feel it deserves a little shine in our conversation. This song, this really cool, interesting song. It feels like it, it kind of came out of Nashville in the future. I don't know. Or it's Nashville in the past. Or Nashville in the past. Maybe it's a bit of both. Maybe it's Westworld. <laughs> <laughs> It's all sibulation. Um, what makes a woman? Yeah, I, this song was created just as a an appreciation for women. And it was a, a song that I was writing before I actually got pregnant. And now it's like taking on a deeper meaning. I'm like, whoa, women are able to create a life and like live and deal with all this stuff and give birth to a watermelon through a fucking tiny thing? Great. <laughs> this is wild. Yep, that's nature. <laughs> Your body is amazing. <laughs> yeah. You know, when you try and define a woman, it's really hard because they're such chameleons. They're so transformative. And I'm really speaking about myself, which is, and I've said this several times, I, I'm not one thing, and I don't like to be put in a box, even sonically or when I experiment with music, but... I have wild ideas of like going to Oxford one day. And some people are like, ah, great, cool. I'm like, why not? I mean, I did get my GED, right? So there's there's some things that are, you know, people would have a comment on. But, you know, I have these out of the box dreams still or ideas or dimensions that I want to touch in my life. And I, I feel like women are, are are very chameleic in that way, that they are not just one thing. They are uh, so malleable and so elastic. And yet you've, you've spent a, a majority of your adult life in an industry which has tried so hard to define female artists. It's still, it's, it's still not good. And you know what I will say is some of it comes from the audience, they like to pit us against each other. I was going to say, it, all, it more often than not, it ends up in some kind of very strange perceived dysfunction within the artist's room where a female artist and a female artist end up at, you know, at each other. And it just, I never know how that starts. And I could trace it back as a super fan. I never know how it starts. We never see uh, Niall Horan and Shawn Mendes fighting. Like, we never see it. I'd pay to, though. Yeah, that would be hot. Um, but we don't see it. You don't hear about that. You don't read about, like, Ed Sheeran, you know. Go on. Who's he fighting? <laughs> Go on. <laughs> yeah, who's who's Ed Sheeran and Justin Bieber fighting? Right? <laughs> you never hear that about it. I would it. see. Wow. Who's going to win that? No, but hang on. Hold that thought because we're on a serious topic, but we can't sidestep that. I mean, Niall Horan and Sean Menes, it's obviously Niall. Like, Sean's got reach. He's tall, but Niall's Irish. He's going to beat the shit out of him. But when it comes to Ed <laughs> Sheeran and Justin Bieber. I don't know. We just don't hear about it. That's why it's an exciting thing to talk about now because you've never, ever heard about it. But, like, take any female performer and you hear about it every single day. Like, you read, you want to read Twitter comments? No. Somebody want to take my account and read my Twitter comments? No, you don't. <laughs> you don't because it's like, it's all about like, who's better than who? Who's skinnier than who? Who sold more number ones than who? Who's doing better this year than who? Who made this much more? Blah, 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 blah. It's like, okay, well, what about just like liking the music? Like, why is it about, why? Why? Did you ever get swept up in it though? Did you ever find yourself, even just subconsciously, because you're exposed to it all the time and you're and you're facing all of this all the time, that the bloodlust catches? You're just like, ah. Oh! I am competitive, but I'm not competitive with women. Mm. No, 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 no. I'm competitive in that I want to succeed. I care about my art and I hope that it reaches. That's how I'm competitive. But like I actually truly want every single female 
in the industry to feel supported and loved and feel like they can speak their truth and deliver their message no matter how many of us women are in the industry. I mean, time and time again, like, I want to hire w more women than men. I want to give them, I want to support them, you know, because I know what it feels like to, like, just be in a room of all of my my female peers and go, do you like me? I really want to like you. I want to talk to you. I know we're going through the same exact thing. Like, we're literally going through the same exact thing. Can't we talk about this? Yeah. There's only five other people in the world that are going through this, and you're in the same room. Can we please just have some wine and talk about how hard this is? Please. You know? And... Like that, that would have been amazing. I, I think we're more there than we were at five years ago. I think there's been, you know, an evolution, but there has to continue to be. I think amongst peers, there's more understanding and compassion and love, but it has to definitely also be in, in the listeners and the fans that, you know, the, the real fans, they also have to not play the petty game with us. I agree. We talked a bit about this when we first met. It was the first kind of common ground we landed on really early on, which was this idea of um, trying to to encourage artists to acknowledge the stresses, strains, and demands that are placed on artists now versus before. And you and you've seen this transition yourself. As fans, we have every availability to you. We have this insatiable desire and appetite for quote unquote content. We have all of the tools and platforms for you to feed me, feed me. Dopamine, 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 dopamine. Yeah. And by the way, I'm talking about myself here. I'm not throwing judgment at any fans out there. I'm, I'm, I'm the same. I'm a pop culture lover. I love it. I lust. So I'm like, if you want my attention and you don't want A, if you want to be A and not B, C, D, E or whatever, F or G, then you've got to keep me pumped up. And what I've been noticing in, in recent conversations that I've been having, and it's been pretty evident in the conversations, the way they've come out, is that artists are tired. And that it's exhausting and the demands are exhausting and that it doesn't feed the soul. It just feeds the timeline. And we spoke about this and I know that you're very, you feel the same way. And there's got to be a conversation. We have to use this kind of experience to have this conversation so that we can educate each other as to what the actual outcome is and how dangerous it can be because it leads to coping mechanisms which are more easily available than ever before right over the fucking counter and then we lose good people because they can't handle the the stress. We lose good people. You lose the artist. I see artists out there that I've known for, you know, a decade. They're not there anymore. They're not present anymore. They're not there. And it's sad. It's sad that they felt like they had no choice. And obviously, we all have a choice and it's up to us to do the changing. I just hope one day there is somewhere artists can go or a community or we can just shift, you know, our, our perspective a little bit as a whole in general. But, um, it's not for me, I'm not tired. It's sad. I'm not tired. It's sad. Yes. It's sad to see when, you know, artists are on a cocktail of medications and they're just not like they were. It's sad that like artists OD. It's sad that you don't see artists becoming grandmas and grandpas because they shoot themselves in the head. It's sad. Why is that fucking glorified? Why is that rock and roll? Why is that cool? That's not cool. That's someone's brother. That's someone's sister. That's someone's mom. That's someone's dad. That's someone's niece or nephew. That is someone's life. It's not part of the trade. It doesn't come along with the territory. And artists that think that they they have to stay in pain in order to be interesting and cool and creative are lying to themselves. And I lied to myself for a really long time. I was like, I don't want to face my demons because what if I'm not like, I don't have anything to say afterwards. I get scared to go to therapy because, you know, all of a sudden I don't feel as intensely, you know. I think the stigma of mental health and the conversation has to be broad. The stigma has to be taken off. I think media has to have some accountability. I don't know if they ever will, but what I do believe is I believe the fans, the fans will have it before the media has it. But like I said earlier in this conversation, the people have the power.
So they can make the change. They control the media. What happened first, the music or the music industry? The music, then the industry was born out of it. Remember, the people have the power. So it's up to us to do our individual work. 